in the heart of the Rocky Mountains. Holy I gotta check the water level on that. A sudden spike in the weather wreaks havoc on the Canadian Pacific Railway. Quite a mess. Triggering a mudslide. These things can happen in the blink of an eye. And a washout. Holy that water raised nine inches overnight. All it takes is one little mess up and it'll escalate quickly. That threaten to shut down this lifeline. You start bending metal, the price tag is huge. <laughs> Carved into the rugged passes and deep canyons of British Columbia lies the backbone of a country. The people who laid this track fought for every mile, some paying with their lives. The Canadian Pacific Railway built this country, and I'm proud to be part of this. If this railway hadn't been built, there's a good chance that this country wouldn't look the way it does on the maps. But right now, a snap warm spell has triggered thunderstorms that threaten this treacherous stretch of railroad. The pounding rain melted the snow on top of the mountain, creating massive mudslides throughout the Rockies. For engineer Jordy Hunter, today's delivery will be no ordinary journey. I've punched slides with the trains. We've hit rocks. I've had close calls. But being an engineer is the pinnacle of my life. I'm going to give notice here, Jordy. Uh, yeah, OK. Yeah. Jordy and conductor Jim Smith are transporting six high-priority, 540-ton cars of red shale to a cement plant in Alberta. Shale, a hardened form of clay, is a crucial ingredient for making the cement that's used to build hospitals, schools, sidewalks, and skyscrapers across the country. The cars of shale are being shipped alongside containers crammed with household goods, including pop and beer, as part of a mixed merchandise or manifest train. I've been accused of using the word sexy and manifest in the same sentence. I have to say that the sexiest trains out here are manifest trains. And manifest trains are trains that have box cars, tank cars, flat cars, just about anything you can imagine that rolls on rails. Some of that stuff is really old, but it's beautiful. So we'll look after the brewery's beer. Right? Yeah, we got to look after the brewery's beer. But the beer isn't what keeps Jordy up at night. They're also carrying a single car of hazardous material, which is highly explosive. We're giving emergency response on how to deal with that car in the event of a derailment. Uh, this specific car is saying that it contains flammable liquid. It has got diesel gas. Jordy and Jim need to haul their 3,600 ton load 614 kilometers east across the country. From Ashcroft, BC, they must navigate around Shuswap Lake, through Revelstoke, up to Kicking Horse Pass, before descending down into Exshaw, Alberta. We're here to move freight. That's what we do best, right? Eh? Oh, yeah. <laughs> In the mountains. Who's on the other side, PK and trains? Roadmaster Chad Deschamps and his team in Revelstoke are battling floods to make sure Jordy and Jim don't get delayed, or worse, derailed. Right now, our biggest monster out there is, is water. The snowpack is melting rapidly, which impacts the, the, the waterway systems around the, the railway tracks. The water is rising really rapidly right now. That causes washouts. Might not seem like much, but as you can see, the mud holes starting to start too. Um, uh, with this condition right now, we're fearing drastic mudslides and rock slides uh, impacting the tracks. Mother Nature, if we don't stay on top of her, she's going to take advantage of us when we got her guard down. Holy <laughs> Yeah, see that? I got to check the water level on that. If that water level rises rapidly tonight, we could have a flood and a washout because it wasn't that high yesterday, so. Before we Travis Clark, Chad Deschamps on 11, over. Uh, we're just gonna head over to this bridge at 25.8. Chad needs to investigate the rising water under the bridge at Eagle River. You gotta come down here, right? <sighs> Holy <laughs> That water raised nine inches overnight. If we get too much water with this rain, we could face a situation where it could wash out our tracks. Oh, yeah. We gotta get prepared for a possible flood. The Rockies make their own weather. The air at the bottom of the mountains is warm and wet. At the top, 
cold and dry. As these two systems collide, all hell breaks loose. Roadmaster Shane Goodyear saw it happen here, just last night, 160 kilometers up the line at Shushwap Lake. On uh, Saturday night about 11 p.m., a train reported hitting a rock slide. It turned out that higher up the mountain, water came down, and it washed all the uh, rock and debris from the ravine here, plugged up the culvert, and then went over top of the track in front of the train. You can actually hear the rocks tumbling for about one to two minutes before they would hit the lake. Shane captured this video of the washout. Okay, so in the video, it shows just how uh, quickly this can happen within a few minutes of the water creasing over the track. But as you can see here, it took away the whole shoulder of the track, washed it down right from below the rail, out the lakeside. So now that side of the track, see the end of the ties, they're all unsupported. The force of the water caused the shoulder of the track to completely disintegrate. The deluge washed rocks, mud, and trees down the side of the mountain. This debris blocked the special drain called a culvert that runs under the railroad and forced the flood water to rise over the tracks. The water washed away the soil underneath the wooden ties, leaving the rails suspended in the air. By the looks of the mud right here, on this, you can see it's about eight, nine feet down to the creek, so it shows you how much momentum that energy had when it came down. And uh, you say these things can happen in a blink of an eye. So you could go by one minute and it just happens uh, right there in front of you or right behind you, or worse yet, it catches you. Shane's crew has been working through the night to clear the debris away from the culvert to allow the water to drain. We had to come in with a lot of riprap rock and reshore up the whole structure and build it back up to the track grade. So, uh, so far, we've dealt with nine of these locations. We're expecting uh, another three days of heavy rain coming, so we're having to be on standby out of 55 hours, I had maybe five hours of sleep because it was just one after the other after the other. So you're just constantly going, you get it going, and another one would hit, and then another one, and it uh, keeps you on your toes. Hey, Wolf, uh, train is going to be coming by. Shane is under tremendous pressure to get this track back in service so Jordy and Jim's train can roll through this zone. This is a valuable Expedia freight that has priority shipments. So they can't delay this train because it's got all the expedited and time-sensitive freight. It's a scheduled train, and it has to arrive just on time. Time is money. The train can run between $500 to $1,000 a minute to hold up. I always think of us as the waistline of the hourglass, and we're that pinch point of how much flow can get through. On the edge of Shushwap Lake, a few feet up into the ravine there, so you can see how the washout erodes the uh, banks up ahead here and takes out the material and deposits it down here. Roadmaster Shane Goodyear is struggling to get the track back in service after a mudslide obliterated it. Mother Nature's always in control. <laughs> no matter what you can try to do or plan. Jordy and Jim's shale train is scheduled to pass through here in less than an hour but they're already entering the edge of the mudslide zone that's overwhelming the rail crews. We're uh, coming up to a mudslide three or four weeks ago, and I had actually just, just missed it. Oh, yeah? Yeah. The cliffs and ground along this stretch are unstable. Areas like this that have already been hit by a slide are the most likely to cave in again. Rock and mudslides have plagued this mountain line ever since it was constructed over 135 years ago. In 1903, 82 million tons of rock fell from the summit of Turtle Mountain into the Crow's Nest River below, in what's now infamously known as the Frank Slide. Rolling boulders, trees, and debris rained down onto the coal mining town of Frank, Alberta for a minute and a half. The slide killed 90 people and annihilated two kilometers of the railroad that had to be cleared one boulder at a time. Around the next curve there, yeah. uh, close to the intermediate, it'll be up there. It was a substantial one, too. And fortunately, they uh, went through it. But you don't want to end up in the lake. Quite a mess. I had to put it down a bit more extra ballast. Look at that, eh? Yeah. You don't really have time to be scared. 
what you do is you just react. And sometimes they're big slides. You don't know what's in it. It could be boulders, it could be trees. You don't want to pull the air and then end up in emergency stopped in the middle of a slide. That's bad, because now you're stuck. I'm not going to stop. I'm punching it. I'm going through it. Hopefully, we're going to stay on the track. Uh, whenever I hear something about trains from Jordy, I'm almost always learning something new. you got to absorb that information, because it might just save your life. Keep calm and carry on. Twenty-five hundred kilometers east of the Rockies in Ontario, the Ontario Northland Railway shuttles crucial supplies to remote communities that lie between the towns of Cochrane and Moosonee. You want to make that joint? Just make sure MJ is still clear. Right. Yard foreman Jay Faldine and his crew are battling bone-chilling temperatures to load up a critical shipment of prefabricated houses to send north. Where about to you, Taylor? I'll go down for the cut here and shed one. Okay. Winters aren't fun, but it's something you get used to. Temperature-wise, probably the worst I've dealt with was in Moosonee, and it was minus 53. That that was pretty extreme, though. I'd, I'd say average in the wintertime, minus 30 is, you can pretty much expect that every day. As long as you're working, you're, you're nice and warm. You stay warm, as long as you keep moving around. <laughs> the houses are headed to Attawapiskat a remote First Nations village which is just south of the Arctic Circle. New construction is nearly impossible in this extreme environment. The winters can get really cold up here, minus 40, 45. It can get extremely cold. That's when we have trouble with our equipment. Wheels won't turn, everything freezes, truck won't start, you know. Attawapiskat has a housing crisis. Cracked walls, poor insulation, flooding, and mold have led to one quarter of the houses here being condemned. But families haven't left them yet. There's nowhere else to live. The old houses around here, they get extremely cold, you know, they're not built for this kind of weather, you know, poor, poor houses. But new homes that we bring up here, they're well built. They're super insulated. Today's shipment contains four new prefab homes. And for the families waiting for them, every day counts. When these houses get there, They'll be happy. You're on there, uh, Taylor. We'll be down the other end there in a minute. Rail crews need to haul the houses 300 kilometers from Cochrane north to the end of the line in Moosonee. Then things get tougher. The houses need to be loaded onto trucks that haul them 312 kilometers further north across an ice road to reach their final destination in Attawapiskat. 12 feet right on. Jay's crew stacks the houses high on blocks so they will ride up and over the guardrails of the narrow bridges along the way. All the houses, they've been measured, they've been chained down. That one there sticks out the end. So going around curves up to, on the way to Moosonee, that might cause problems. Those ones there as well, how close they are together, we gotta put an empty flat in there. Just to make sure none of the houses bump into each other on the way. When we get going a good speed, they'll rock back and forth, and they got to keep an eye, make sure nothing gets a little cockeyed on the flats, because that would be one heck of a mess if one of these fell off. We're just putting the last one on there now. Then all of them will have the right spacing in between them. Locked and loaded, the houses head north. In Revelstoke, Roadmaster Chad Deschamp is struggling to beat Mother Nature at her own game. In the last week or so, the waters rose about four feet. I was watching the weather net and they're calling for storms in the next couple days. They're gonna go for a helicopter ride too, just to make sure that the last rainfall didn't impact anything up top. So that one we always have trouble with frost, Steve. Chad is trying to predict when and where mudslides strike, so he doesn't get taken by surprise. If we follow the rail line over there, hit the, the dump. Yep. And then yeah. Yeah. To do this, he needs a bird's eye view. When we do our earlier surveys, what we'll do is we'll find these drainages and then we'll follow them all the way up to see if there's any kind of a blockage that's starting. Maybe some tree debris came down roots. You can see the water pooling. Then you'll know that it's going to come down to hit us. Did you ever get some rock falls there from that left there, Chad? Yeah, about uh, 4.9. Oh, yeah. 
Looks like there's a pool down there too. We could probably clean up. Yeah, you betcha. How's the beaver at this pond here? Uh, he's been moving back and forth from the uh, north side to the south side. Just have a little look in the gully there to make sure there's nothing plugging it. With the uh, beaver dam? Yeah. They've spotted a beaver dam that could cause problems. Beavers use mud and branches to create flooded areas that protect them from predators such as wolves. But if this dam grows too big, it could block the river and cause the tracks nearby to flood. I go in there with that high tracker and uh, if we can disrupt this beaver dam, we're gonna have to get a hole in there. That would be good. Yeah. At Shuswap Lake, the train is going to be coming by here in uh, one or two minutes. Roadmaster Shane Goodyear has the track back in service. So now we've cleared the track there a few minutes earlier. We have our first train coming, and he should be coming through this tunnel here within one or two minutes. 8754 West, approaching 25 mile per hour slow. The slide is yeah, just up here? Yeah, the slide is just up here, around this curve here. You don't run through them every day. Yeah. No, you don't see those every day. Well, it feels good, and that's, that's basically what we're here for, right? We've got to overcome these challenges. Uh, now you know these guys can travel through here safely and go home at the end of the day unharmed. Two hundred kilometers east ahead of the train, and twenty-six hundred feet up, the mountain temperature is still far below zero. We're at mile 19 right here, and we're about to get on track to change the rail. Here in Golden, Canadian Pacific's track crew needs to replace a damaged piece of rail. This is one of the more challenging and dangerous places to work at all the CP due to the mountainous train the trains have to go through and the amount of curves in the tracks. All right, ready to go. 24-year-old Jesse Dahlberg is a rookie. He hasn't earned his stripes yet. Or in this case, he hasn't earned the right to wear orange yet. Yes, they refer to me as the green vest. I'm supposed to have it on for one year, and then I graduate to the CP orange vest. I'm very eager to get out of this green vest, get a little bit more respect from the guys, maybe. To earn that respect, Jesse has to do the toughest jobs, good old-fashioned manual labor. I worry about messing up as a green vest. I don't want to let anyone down, cause my foreman to be in trouble because he had to help a train. So there is a little bit of uh, stress there of, for not Jesse, watch your back. Yeah, go, yeah, in. Jesse's boss is foreman John Lindhorst. Here, watch yourself. Yep. Yeah. Now, in any particular place, the rail's used, or to some degree used. Trains have run over it. So we have to find a piece of rail that we can, with the technology we have, match in to fit within certain tolerances. The closer we can get it to match, the better. The surface of the replacement rail, called the headwear, must match the width and thickness of the old track. If it doesn't, the train wheels could catch as they ride over the repair, causing damage, or worse, an accident. Good. Yeah. Uh, right now, I'm just drilling holes for the joint bars. You got six holes in each joint bar. Put track bolts in there, bolt them together. For bigger jobs, a welder would be on hand to fuse the track together. But for single track replacements like this, they connect the pieces using a metal bar called a joint bar. Give it a little love tap, maybe. There we go. The joint bar must sit flush to the new piece of track to hold it securely. So on the other side, let's hit this one here. Gotta hit this bar down a little yeah. bit. But there's something wrong. I'm just trying to get the joint bar on very properly. It's uh, not sitting quite right. Oh, I've never seen that like that before. Yeah. I'm not 100% of what the problem is. That's why I'm the, the rookie. We got 19 minutes. Well, we got a new That's a new bar. In Golden. I'm just going to put the nut on the end. Jesse and the crew are struggling to replace a broken rail. That's it for that one. The steel joint bar that attaches the new section to the existing rail won't fit properly. Uh, take it off, take it off. The rail has been transposed, which means that it's been moved from one side of the track to the other. 
the wheels have deformed the rail to a degree, and you have to grind that deformation off in order to get the bars to seat properly and hold correctly. The replacement track was chosen because the headwear matches the existing rail, but they salvaged the rail from used track. Its outside edge has been worn down by passing trains. The deformation isn't easy to spot, but it's enough to prevent the joint bar from sitting flush under the new rail. No, we gotta take this off. They have no option but to tear the joint bar off and grind down the deformed replacement track. This is something you gotta watch for anytime you get transposed rail. Yeah. Done. The last step was making sure that the train flows nicely over top. No bumps or anything when it goes by. It's complete now. It was pretty good. One hiccup could have gotten a little better, but it was not bad at all. Halfway across the country, engineer Sean Mills is in the hot seat of the Ontario Northland train. Alongside him, Philip Selman and trainee Thomas Skinner. 1806 North, one mile gale to no restrictions. They're hauling the prefabricated houses to the end of the line in Moosonee. Houses are looking good. There's four on the train taking up north with us today, so we've been busy. They're approaching the first hurdle of the trip. We have to come to a stop here in a couple of miles and proceed with caution over this bridge uh, up here. Four bridges offer the only route through this landscape, which is all creeks, rivers, and swamps. The bridge girders sit high above the ground to allow ice to pass underneath during spring breakup. But the high girders make transporting wide loads like these a nightmare. We're gonna stop for the bridge and uh, Phil should be getting out on one side and Thomas will get out the other. We'll proceed uh, by radio communication we usually have enough clearance, but I've been on one train where there's been just enough clearance, maybe half an inch. You should have room, but if you're gonna hit this, let me know, we'll stop it. If there's any rocking whatsoever, there's a chance the houses could hit the bridges. And they're clear. One bridge down, three to go. In Revelstoke, Chad has tracked down the beaver dam he spotted from the air. Well, this is the prime suspect here. This was a problem that was causing the stagnant water. A single beaver dam can redirect an entire river, flooding hundreds of acres. Unchecked, this one could grow blocking the waterway and submerging the nearby tracks. We have had previous floodage. It would wash away the uh, shoulder. So I want to get on it now before it gets to that point. Jeffy, I'll show you anywhere. here. I take the grapple and just loosen it up a bit. I got to watch out for the wires. Chad's called in a 10-ton truck equipped with a grapple to remove the dam. As soon as I get set up, I want you guys to uh, watch for power lines. Somebody's going to keep an eye out that I don't clip them. It's a big truck on a small road. So lining up the grapple with the dam won't be easy. Cut it hard! To make Chad's task even more difficult, one of his guys is a no-show. Oh. And this isn't the first time. There's an issue? Yeah. Jimmy Taylor is Chad Deschamps' biggest headache. I guess everyone just looks at me as a dumb kid, which is pretty true. In the last six months, he's committed the cardinal railroading sin. I ended up leaving a switch open. I lost a lot of pay, I lost a lot of privileges, and especially I lost a lot of respect. We all have bad days, buddy. Being repeatedly late for work. I apologize to Chad for um, not showing up on time or uh, just being a general smartass. And it's never good when your boss hears you've been bad-mouthing him behind his back. It seems like Chad is under a lot of stress at all times, but the thing is, he relays the stress that he's under onto his employees. 
and quite a bit too. When everybody has a problem with you, maybe everybody else isn't the problem. Maybe it's yourself that is the problem. But the thing about Jimmy that really gets under Chad's skin. You want to see a magic trick? No. Is that Jimmy loves magic more than he loves the railroad. If you do this, it feels like you're running an accelerated rate. Thank you. I'd love to just spend my life on magic. You have the fantasy, which is the magician thing, but then you have real life, which is, you know, the CP thing. I think I need to move to a bigger city. Revelstoke's best magician, because I'm Revelstoke's only magician. It's funny, but it doesn't pay the bills. Chad's biggest concern is Jimmy's lack of focus. The operations of the railway is a huge commitment, and you have to have your heart into it. There's that log right there. I'll, I'll try and pull it from the bank. Our team here, we, you know, we try to work safe and comply with all the rules. Well, it's just sometimes you give a person advice, but they're not taking it serious. That's what worries me is the, the lack of seriousness. I know he's going to get injured just because he has that attitude, and I don't want that to happen. I just need him to really focus and know that this is the real thing. You want me to go up further than that, don't you? Right? If anything, hey, Jeff, you can go back to where you were at the very beginning, but closer in. They have no choice but to start tearing the dam apart one man down. Right there? Good, good, good. While Chad tries to track down his problem child. That's bullshit. <laughs> 140 kilometers east. Jordy and Jim roll clear of the mudslide zone. Rule A is always wave to the kids. It changed my life. When the engineer or the conductor waved to me, it was, it was like meeting God. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we got someone up here, they might wave, let's see. This is the best part of the job. There's an older kid. No, <laughs> he doesn't care. <laughs> I love working with Jordy because he loves trains. <laughs> He's crazy about trains. He loves trains. FDN stands for a freaking train nut. He's one of them, kind no, of. No, I'm, I'm just, yeah, yeah, yeah. A, a proper term would be foamer. <laughs> foamer, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm a foamer. Yeah. yeah. Foamer, as in foaming at the mouth for trains. He's a foamer. The thing that attracts me to this job is everything. It's the size of the equipment. It's the power of the equipment. It's just the uh, total assault on the senses of uh, sound and sight, and it's even got its own smell. near Revelstoke. Chad and his crew are almost finished removing the beaver dam. Legs up, boom down. Yep. Jimmy finally shows up for his shift, but not in time to save his skin. After the job is done, Chad pulls Jimmy off site to have a talk. Absentees. Yeah, I've shown up late many times. I believe uh, my running count is five which is nowhere near acceptable. I'm not putting up with it, so you know what I mean? Like, when you come to work, you gotta be focused. I I'm serious. I'm I worried about you. After suffering months of bad behavior from Jimmy, Chad has had enough. I'm worried about you. I don't care about the soap opera stuff around here. I care about your well-being. I care about you working safe. And that's the bottom line. You might think I'm stern. You might think I'm a tyrant. But this is the real deal here. Because if you get injured, I have to live with it for the rest of my life. My best friend got killed on the railway. A long time ago, my best friend was unfortunately uh, uh, crushed by a, a piece of equipment. And he was pretty proud to get a job with the railway. He's watched me and we were good friends and he's seen what the railway done, you know, employed me and, and, and uh, he wanted to be one of those people. And uh, unfortunately, uh, he's gone. But I think for your best interest is to go try something else. Chad is sending Jimmy to work with a different crew that lays thousands of feet of rails a week. It's called working on the gangs because it's like doing hard time. Jimmy will finish out the week and then pack up for North Bend, BC. As they pull into Revelstoke, it's the end of the line for Jordy and Jim. While they rest up, All right. a fresh crew will take over to navigate the train through the high mountain passes, perilous even in the best weather. Right now, 
the forecast is calling for snow. 2,500 kilometers east in northern Ontario. Engineer Sean Mills and his crew are just 15 kilometers south of Moosonee, where they'll hand off their load of prefabricated houses to the trucking crew. It's good news. We're on the home stretch. But with just one more bridge to cross, they run into trouble. I'm not imagining it, right? No. Okay. Yep. We've got a container that we're going to take a look when we get stopped here. Uh, we're just checking this container. He's not straight. Supposed to be straight, and she's one end a little crooked. Yeah, she's not leaning the right way. No, 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 no. See this whole thing? It's collapsed. Not good. One of the rail cars close to the houses is carrying two containers. Their combined weight is 40 tons. They're so heavy that they've caused the steel trestle that supports them to collapse. One of the two chains holding the crates has lost its grip, putting the second under intense strain. If it snaps, the load could roll over. We've got a metal frame collapse on the cart. Uh, we're going to tighten the chains up on the one side, and we should be able to get it in the Moosonee anyway. Yeah, yeah we'll go to 10 miles an hour and we'll walk up. I can't see it going anywhere. This flattened right out. Like, the, if it wasn't for the jacks there for, for the truck, Got to fall right to the ground, flatten the steel right out. If we didn't have the big dimensional houses on and had the guys go and check at the bridges, we would have we would have never noticed that. If it did fall off, it could have definitely derailed the train. Could have been disastrous. So I think it's a good thing that those houses were on there today, and we were checking it out. That's for sure. We have to uh, proceed the uh, rest of the way into Moosonee at restricted speed. Snow is hitting the Rockies hard, burying the tracks just as the shale train heads into steep terrain. You get more than three inches of snow, and it does affect the adhesion to the rail. So we end up becoming like a toboggan, sliding on the rail itself. The new crew, engineer Andrew Dockrell and conductor Jordan Gillis, must fight the snow to coax the train down the mountain into the foothills of Alberta. You can get a runaway really, really easily. It was pretty severe and life-threatening for sure. The whole way up leads to this part of your trip right here. The downslope here is 2.5%. It's one of the steepest rail descents on Earth. It's not an ordinary train ride down this hill got to be on your game and expect the worst and pray for the best. The key to navigating a slope like this, in the snow, is to gain control of the descent before it even starts. I have to keep an eye on uh, brake adhesion, and if I'm not on top of it, we can pick up quite a bit of speed and increase in, in a, like a matter of seconds. So I have to apply a couple extra pounds air brake or more dynamic brake. Each locomotive that powers the train is fitted with dynamic brakes. But these aren't enough to stop the fully loaded 3,600-ton train. So each rail car has its own set of air brakes. Air tanks, pressurized to 100 pounds per square inch, power all these air brakes. A pipe distributes the compressed air along the length of the train. Constant air pressure keeps the brakes off. A lever allows the driver to release air from the system, activating the brakes on each car, slowing the train down. Each individual train and every train is different. Heavier trains, you need more braking application compared to the lighter trains. When you get too complacent is when accidents happen on this hill. All it takes is one little mess up and it'll escalate quickly. Andrew and Jordan's 3,600-ton train is dipping into a legendary steep descent through a whiteout. It's steep, 
with our tonnages that we're hauling on long trains, things can get out of hand. It takes great skill knowing how much braking force to apply to keep the train wheels gripping the icy tracks. So we have to be 100% focused going down this hill. If we're not, we could uh, run away. We made her. We made her. No better feeling than making it down in one piece. What time are you showing in? 29. In Revelstoke. I'm heading out to the gangs. Jimmy is packing up to go work on the steel gangs, laying railway track. Honestly, I uh, know where Chad's coming from. He's given me a lot of helpful and useful advice, and I'll take it to heart. He'll be working eight days on, six days off, living out of a hotel. I heard it was a good idea to bring a toaster oven, in case there's no microwave, and the entertainment. This right here is my magic box. It doubles as a stage wherever you might be. Never leave home without it, literally. I mean, I'm playing it off like I don't really care, but uh, it's a scary thing, leaving off for the first time like this. I have no idea what the work's gonna be like. Basically, any first job uh, worries you might have, it's all happening right now. See you there, buddy. Have a good one. I'll keep my head down, keep my mouth shut. I know that's pretty hard to believe, me keeping my mouth shut. Well, you watch over the place while I'm gone. There's a lot of new ahead of me, a lot of old behind me, and that's kind of the way I wanted to keep it. And uh, I'll be back. I know I will. Near Kicking Horse Pass, Andrew and Jordan face the last hurdle. Uh, we're about to enter spiral tunnels. There's no ventilation in the tunnels. So uh, if something does happen and the train does come to a stop, there are gas masks for uh, the conductor and engineer to use. Because when uh, you do stop the exhaust from the locomotives, fill the uh, tunnels pretty quickly. Pretty bad position to be in if you don't have a gas mask. The spiral tunnels were completed in 1909 to reduce the grade of the deadly hill leading down into field. It took two years for Canadian Pacific crews to blast and drill their way through nearly a mile of solid limestone. Unlike most train tunnels, these ones were bored into the core of the mountains, making ventilation impossible. The solution was to install gas masks and oxygen kits at regular intervals, should the train have to stop suddenly midway through. Which is exactly what happened to Andrew. Three years ago, I was involved in an incident. We were derailed, and I had to do my inspection where I had to go back, check the train out. Within 10 minutes of me being in here, I had to get a gas mask. And thank God there were masks and these oxygen canisters to help with us breathing. I don't think I would have made it if these gas masks weren't here. It's a great feeling, eh, Jordan, when you come down through the upper and the lower tunnel after a long trip, eh? Feels good to make it down. No issues. It's nice to see population again after coming down that hill. Makes you know you made it in one piece. In Ontario. Hey, it's Moosey. This is the end of the line for the houses for us. Sean and his rail crew made it to Moosey intact and in time to hand off the houses to the trucking crew. Coming on the line. That'll do. Good going. Now the guys here are just taking all the chains off and getting them ready to unload. The houses need to reach Attawapiskat by day's end. The 312-kilometer journey will take five hours by ice road. That's if nothing goes wrong. We're getting some fuel so we don't run out of fuel. Nice to have a full tank just in case something happens on a winter road. The trucks might be idling all night or whatever. Good to have that. I'll just check the back. Ice road trucker Jim Wesley heads up the convoy. Yeah, little you. The drivers stay in touch with each other via radios. And everybody's in a mad rush too to get all their freight right now. And... The surface of the ice road is roughed up regularly, but the more traffic that passes, the smoother it gets. And on a sunny day, it's like a skating rink. The road is all ice capped and it's super slippery. That makes it a little bit more dangerous, I guess. 
keeps you on your toes. <laughs> There's a pickup truck and a snow bike just up ahead here. <laughs> he went right on top of the snow bike and he came down on the other side. <laughs> but that's why he pays to go slow around these corners and just take your time because you never know what's going to be around the corner. Hitting one of these snow banks at 50 kilometers an hour is like smashing into a brick wall. There's going to be a sharp right turn coming up. Oh, yes. It's a slip breather, X. Jimmy, watch the corner there. Uh, okay, thanks. Crack there, but it's okay. Take it a little slow here. We gotta go slow. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Holy. On the ice road to Attawapiskat. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Oh, I think I should take it a little slow here. We gotta go slow. Pressure cracked there, but it's okay. Holy. Oh, damn. Oh, my holy. <laughs> Did you see that? Miss me like about inches. Yeah, I should have an escort with that guy. After an arduous five-hour journey, the new houses finally arrive in Attawapiskat. Houses have come on a journey. They've come first by train, then on the ice road, and here they are. They found their new home. <laughs> it's a huge relief for Lawrence, who will install the houses on their foundation pads for the owners. This year, we're lucky. Uh, we're very glad that they made it up here on time. Over the next year, Lawrence's team will hook the houses up to services, ready for families to move in. Andrew and Jordan's train is leaving the foothills of the Rockies behind and closing in on its final destination. Our ship's done. We're back at home and we're safe and sound. After an epic trek, the crew has successfully delivered the six cars of red shale to the cement plant just outside Calgary, Alberta. Well, it's always a relief when we see the CP cars coming in. Without red shale, we would not be able to make our products. For the schools, hospitals, uh, we have 150 employees here. There's over 7,000 indirect jobs that, re that rely on this plant to be operating. So it's really important that we keep the material flowing. Next time, spring brings a whole new set of problems. With the weather we're having, a rock slide can come down at any time. Unstable mountains threaten the rail crews and their precious cargoes. If I had men working here and not landed on them, that'd be game over. As they struggle to keep the trains rolling. You definitely don't want to be in the wrong place at the wrong time around here. 